أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يقنت منكن لله ورسوله وتعمل صالحا نؤتها أجرها مرتين وأعتدنا لها وأعتدنا لها رزقا كريما يا نساء النبي لستن كأحد من النساء إن اتقيتن فلا تخضعن بالقول فلا تخضعن بالقول فيطمع الذي في قلبه مرض وقلن قولا معروفا وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وأقمن الصلاة وأقمن الصلاة وآتين الزكاة وأطعن الله ورسوله إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا واذكرن ما يتلى في بيوتكن من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان لطيفا خبيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Alhamdulillah, we begin the 22nd juz of the Qur'an. That Surah Al-Ahzab, it's a continuation of Surah Al-Ahzab, as you know that after several surahs that were Makki surahs, we've started this Medinan surah in which we've read several laws and there'll be a few more discussions, some very particular discussions, aside from the regular emphasis on Tawheed and the arguments for the existence and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the way it begins, actually this theme that um, these initial verses are discussing starts a few verses back from verse 28 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, in the previous juz, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, qul li azwajik, in kuntunna turidna al-hayata al-dunya wa zinataha, fata'alayna umatti'kunna wa usarrihkunna sarahan jameela. Essentially, this is a choice that was given to the mothers of the believers, as we discovered yesterday, the name, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Essentially, what happened is that as Islam continued, this is a Medinan surah, so as Islam continued, and then after that, they won several different battles, the Futuh that took place, several battles that took place. So, some of the Azwaj, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they made a request. They say that our stipend that you give us, yearly stipend, monthly stipend, generally used to give them um, for the year, some things he used to give them for a year, like some uh, supplies and things like that. So can you increase that a bit? Can you increase our spending money a bit? Because, you know, they, they didn't have any other income. Their income was through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his nafaqa and his spending. So that's when this verse was, re- or these verses rather were revealed which number one gives them a choice, right? And the choice that's given to them is, O Prophet, say to your wives that if you intend the life of the world and its adornment, then come forth. I will give you and then I will release you in a beautiful way. Basically, if you want the dunya, I can give you lots of the dunya. And you can have the dunya and you can do whatever you want. But if you want Allah and His Messenger, وَإِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And the hereafter, the abode of the hereafter, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided and prepared a much greater reward for those muhsinat, those who do good. Muhsinat, plural of muhsina, which basically is the feminine plural of the one who does things in a good way and those who do good deeds and then showing their special status and a special burden upon them as well being the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the final verse there Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that if any of you commit any kind of obscenity may Allah protect them and Allah did protect them 
then your punishment will be given you double. That's easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then Allah gives them a lot of promises as well. وَمَنْ يَقْنُطْ مِنْ كُنَّ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا نُؤْتِهَا أَجْرَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ Those of you who are going to remain with Allah and His Messenger, choose Allah and His Messenger, worship Allah and do good deeds, we will give them their reward twice, double. And we've provided, we've prepared for them amazing, uh, noble sustenance. Now, this is the next lot of this is to do with the virtue of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and certain special commands and uh, certain special um, directives at them primarily, but then many of them are related to all the women of the world as well, the women of Islam as well. So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that. These are the following commands which you'll, you'll, you'll read from the you know, third and fourth verse and onwards, 33, 34. The first one is that you need to remain at home. right? Do not go out unless absolutely necessary. That's why they would only go out when it was necessary. So stay at home. right? And then number two, remember Allah. Uh, actually, the first one before that is in, is in verse 33, which is, وَلَا تَبَرُّ Actually, no, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ uh, The one before that, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Verse 22 rather, verse 22 فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَتْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَدٌ وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Which basically means that when you speak, do not speak in a kind of a softer kind of tone which makes your voice more attractive so that those with illness in their heart uh, will desire, right? And always say good things, remain at home is another one do not expose yourself by going outside like the jahiliya women used to do, where they used to basically display themselves, show themselves off. Nakedness wasn't a big deal in those days, right? So you can't do that as well. Now, as you can see, uh, some ulama, they've argued that some of these things may be related only to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. But you can clearly see that all of this is actually related to all the women. There's nothing in here that's very specific. That's why many say that this is actually completely general for everybody. Then another one is establish the prayer and give the zakat. As you see, it's always and obey Allah and His Messenger. And this is amazing. This is to show the purity of the household of the Prophet ﷺ. You might be thinking, who's going to consider some kind of problem within the household of the Prophet ﷺ? Right? If they love the Prophet. Obviously Muslims, if they love the Prophet. But there are people who call themselves Muslims. Right? But they've got problems with many of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, right? They think that they are plotting against, I don't know what, you know, various different ideas. Like some of the Shias, that's what they have this idea uh, about Aisha radiallahu anha and others as well. Allah says very clearly here in this verse 33, Allah wants to remove from you all dirt. O household of the Prophet ﷺ wants to completely and absolutely and thoroughly purify you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them of another directive, which is, now remember and repeat that which has been related in your homes of the ayat of Allah and the wisdom because they're with a the prophet. So he's getting special revelation from Jibreel alayhi salam. The wives are there as well. So that's also mentioned down there. Now, um, so um, the backdrop of these verses, I explained to you, it was because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the wives had initially asked him for extra expense. And in, uh, in Quran terminology, you call that the Sha'nun Nuzul. The Sha'nun Nuzul, which is essentially the events for the occasion of the revelation, right? The event behind the revelation of those verses. And many, many verses on the Quran of the Quran were revealed for a particular case initially, but then they took on a general universal message for everybody for time immemorial, right? So that's why you call it Sha'nun Nuzul. Sha'nul Nuzul. When you have it in hadith where there's a backdrop for a hadith, it's called Sha'nul Wurud, they generally call that. So Nuzul means the Sha'n means the state of the revelation, the reason for the revelation of the Quran. There's books actually written on that if you want to access those as well. But many tafsirs, they will basically mention the Sha'nul Nuzul because that's what you know, makes, the, makes it much more relevant. Anyway, now, um, these are the, the next verse is a very prominent verse that is often quoted, verse... 35, where in the Muslim, again, there's a Sha'nun Nuzul there, but we can't mention all the Sha'nun Nuzuls, otherwise 
um, will will be here forever. Um, so, inna al muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati wal qanitina wal qanitat. Now, this is the one place in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa taala has mentions the women characteristic along with the male characteristic, the female along with the male characteristic in everything that he mentions. Otherwise, generally throughout the Quran, when he speaks to men, unless it's a command specifically for men, clearly. Uh, it, it, it relates to women as well. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mostly was speaking to men, that's probably why it's mentioned mostly for the men, one of the reasons, and some other reasons. But in this particular case, this verse specifically mentions both. So he mentions Muslimin and Muslimat, Mu'minin and Mu'minat. So whenever you hear the Muslimat, Mu'minat, Qanitat, that's the feminine plural. Whereas Muslimun, Muslimin, the uh, uh, qanitin, qanitu, uh, qanitun, sadiqun, sadi, uh, sabirun, all of that is for the male plural, which is generally the dominant plural for both genders anyway. But here Allah singles them out. What are the characteristics that are mentioned here? Well, Islam, right? That's submission, iman, faith, qunut, which means just constantly worship of Allah, right? Uh, the, uh, truthfulness, patience, reverent fear, sadaqah. And uh, fasting, right? And above all, protection of the private parts. Chastity is constantly mentioned for both as well, right? Now, in Surah Al Ahzab, there's some other famous events that we need to uh, quickly take a look at, and one of them is related to uh, some of the criticisms provided the pe- by the people of Makkah on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What had happened is, as we already mentioned yesterday. The Prophet ﷺ had made Zayd ibn al-Haritha, who used to be a slave first, he made him like a son of his. But after the command was there, he made it very clear that he's not Zayd, uh, Zayd uh, son of Muhammad, he's Zayd son of Haritha. However, Zayd, got, uh, Zayd was initially, the Prophet ﷺ got him married to uh, the Prophet ﷺ's cousin, his paternal auntie's daughter, right? Zaynab bin to Jahash. Now you probably know that name. He got her married. Uh, he got Zayd the married to her, but they just couldn't get along, right? So they couldn't get along. So then Zayd divorced her, and then after that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through this verse uh, mentions this. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to men, to marry uh, Zainab, his cousin. So number one, you've got the discussion of the cousin marriage here, right? Which is not a big deal here, right? There's discussions about that. That's a separate discussion, right? Genetics and all the rest of it. It is allowed in Islam, right? Though in certain cases, you know, some people say there's some genetical issues that come about because of that and so on. Whatever the case is, um, the main point that's mentioned here is that because in the Jahiliya tradition, anybody you called your own son, even though biologically they were not your child, you, they, they treated them as your own child, thus you could not marry them. Right, and you know that all of that would be prohibited in the Jahiliya, uh, jahiliya custom. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to do away with that, and He uses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Himself to basically be the breaker of that custom. Very tough on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do that. Right, that's why He says, "Wa lillati Allahu alayhi wa anamta alayhi amsik alayka zawjak." You know, initially Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told Zayd to try to make it work with Zainab bin Jahash. But it didn't work. That's why فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَتَرَى Verse 37 clarifies this. زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا When Zayd رضي الله عنه divorced Zainab رضي الله عنه, then we married you to her just so from now on there would be no problems right, with believers who wanted to basically marry the divorcees of their fostered child as such. Now remember in those days, women were not left alone. They, they got married, right? You, you, didn't, you didn't find women who were just basically looking for a, you know, for, for a husband. People got married very easily. MashaAllah, they were always the takers for that. So anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that easy, but that was very difficult for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to deal with at that time. So that story is mentioned there uh, in verse 37 and so on. And I mean, this is not the time to talk about uh, 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 polygamy. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's marriage to so many different women, but I'll just mention two very simple points, right? Just, just uh, because there's lots of discussions about that and lots of wisdoms and reasons that have been documented and mentioned, and the benefits that came from Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's multiple wives, right? However, I'll just mention two very big points that uh, you can keep in mind. Number one, 
Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ reasoning for this marriage were, was not to just fulfill desire at all, right? Because if you look at it, for, for the first 25 years, he got married when he was 25 to Khadija radiallahu anhu, who was 40 at the time, right? According to the strongest opinion. And then she passed away in the 10th year of migration, which means that when the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, he, got, he became a prophet at the age of 40. That means he was already married to her for 15 years before prophecy. So from 25 to 40, he's married to her before becoming a prophet. And then for another 10 years afterwards, that means he's married to her for 25 years, to a woman 15 years older than him. And while he was married to Khadija radiallahu anha, for those 25 years, he did not marry anybody else. It's only when he became 50 years old, Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. Then after that, he started getting these proposals. For example, for Aisha radiallahu anha, there was a proposal. And then after that, he married nine women all together at once, meaning uh, they didn't marry immediately all together, but over the course of the next several years, there was a time when it came when he had nine wives at once. Major so that, that's the first point, uh, that it was at an older age when he's 50 years old, not at a young age when generally people are interested in this kind of thing. Number two, the, out of all the wives, all of them, the only wife that out of those nine that was, mar that, that was a virgin and never married before was Aisha radiallahu anha. And there's a documented story of how exactly, in fact, after Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, he actually didn't get married for a, uh, married for a while. Then only afterwards did then, you know, people start discussing and saying you should get married and so on. So then he decided to get married. And um, he had most of, the, in fact, all of them except Aisha radiallahu anha were actually uh, divorcees or widows and so on ha Some of them had their own children And everything like that A lot of them were for alliances And a numerous benefits that came Because remember the Prophet Wasallam Is the shari, he's the legislator And women are part of the community As much as men are How are there going to be narrations How are there going to be transmissions And uh, you know how is the Prophet Wasallam Going to communicate all the Nitty gritty issues related to women It's better that it comes from women That's why one of the most prolific I think she's number uh, Within the top five narrators of hadith Overall is Aisha radiallahu anha Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is the highest Right But then she comes I forget exactly Second, third or fourth She is the, one of the most prolific narrators of hadith that gives you a whole understanding of the inside of the home, the personal life, the intimacy issues and so on and so forth. If we didn't have all of these wives, there they, they would be so much that we would miss out on. And that's why there's huge benefit in that. But having said that, I think that should be enough for us to basically understand uh, for the time being. The third point then that we move on to is Allahu Akbar. In the, in the several verses that follow, um, in fact, maybe the next 10, 15, 20 verses, there is praise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So basically the believers are being, you can say, reassured and told that you have to do a lot of shukr and thanks because of the Prophet that has been given to you. And it talks about some of the specific characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ That's verse 40, very important verse, because that is the one in which it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ was the seal of the prophets. So after him, no prophets come. He is the seal of the prophets. So there's no Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani after him. There's no Baha'u'llah, the Baha'is after him. There's no, uh, um, what was his name, uh, Elijah Muhammad and all of these that they're all basically not prophets they're all imposters right and in Islam according to the Islamic understanding God sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the final prophet he's the khatamun nabiyyin and then uh, there's a number of others the next verse oh people who believe remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly and morning and evening glorify him Allahu Akbar and then why that's the case because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the blessings upon you Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said, He mentions about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about five very specific issues about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is a ni'mah uzma, right? Which is the huge bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the ummah. So firstly, Allah says, Ya yu nabiyu inna arsalnaka, verse 45, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheera. We, we have uh, basically sent you as a witness so the Prophet ﷺ is going to be a witness, not just upon the believers, upon the disbelievers, upon all the nations as well on the Day of Judgment. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the message, people got the message, but they didn't believe and so on and so forth. He's a glad tiding giver. He gives you glad tidings for the righteous people and for those who believe of the good things that they get because that's all encouragement. So you need a prophet who gives you encouragement, who tells you, look, this is why you're doing these th things for. People need that to carry on. People, uh, most people will need uh, rewards to do good deeds, to do good acts. Very few people are there who just do good acts for the sake of it. And then nadira, and to give warning, which basically for those who don't listen, for those who are lazy, for those who procrastinate, to, to give warning. And then the next one is, وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجًا munira. And then an invited to Allah, right? An invited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His path, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then addresses him with two very specific characteristics. He says, one, Sirajam Munira, the illuminating lamp, right? The effulgent lamp, right? The illuminated lamp. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him the illuminated because the, the world was in darkness. Over 570 something years, no Prophet had come. So when the Prophet came, he basically had the light spread. And until today, the light is spreading. MashaAllah, the light is spreading. Allahu Akbar, the light is spreading. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him that lamp because in every aspect, he's a lamp in, that can be opened up in many, many ways. He removes people's doubts. He removes uh, the darkness of understanding. He gives people hope for the hereafter, for a life beyond this world. Not just the miserable life of this world, right? And so on and so forth. And of course, once you know the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, once you know what he's commanding us to do, and you know the hadith, and you know his message through the, you know, that he brought as the Quran, then after that we know exactly the right way and the wrong way. So that's another way that he's a lamp as well. Okay, then there's a number of other adab and etiquette which are basically mentioned to remove some of the um, bad vibes and bad habits of the time of Jahiliyyah. Right. There's several other points where I mentioned to remove some of the, uh, you know, h how many wives you could marry and a number of other things like that that are mentioned there. There's some talaq issues as well and mahar issues and so on. You can read that for yourself. I'm jumping to verse number 53. Which is a very interesting verse. Again, there's a backdrop to this. There's a shatnun nuzul to this, right? I'm going to be repeating it so you get you get an understanding of it. Ya yuhaladina amanu la tadkhulu buyut al nabi illa an yuzana lakum ila taamin ghayri ghayr al nazirina ina. Initially, there were there was no hijab laws even for the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Omar radiyallahu anhu several occasions mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that it should happen. The Prophet ﷺ was waiting for a revelation and then finally what happened is that one day the Prophet ﷺ had just been married and he, was, he, he got married and then after that uh, you know, he'd invited some people to eat at his house and he was waiting to be with his wife um, and waiting for people to finish. Now they finished eating but they just sat there and started talking as people do. And now the Prophet ﷺ gets up and leaves. He's too shy, he's too... You know, he, he's too shy a personality when it's a personal issue. When it's a religious issue, he's got no shyness at all. But when it's a personal issue, he's very shy. So actually, Anas reports his entire story because he was his servant at that time. He was only 10 years old when he started, right? And he was 20 when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And he basically served him for 10 whole years, so he knows a lot. He's another prolific narrator. Anyway, so he relates the whole story that the Prophet ﷺ went out, came back in. In fact, he walked out and I think he went all the way to... I think it was Aisha radiallahu anha's house and he comes back and I think this was with Safiya radiallahu anha when this marriage took place. So the people just weren't getting, just weren't getting it. So eventually this verse came down and then anyway people left. So that's why it's saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is very, this was, this was, uh, this was affecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but he is so uh, shy that he wouldn't speak but Allah does not shy of the truth. So now if you are invited, do not enter people's houses but unless you have permission. When you have permission and you go for food, then when you finish food, then just disperse. Unless they want you to stay along for extra tea or extra discussion or whatever, that's fine. But you need to always be aware because you're encroaching and it's, you know, you might say, well, people can tell you to leave. Not everybody can do that. The majority of people have a lot of shyness regarding this, that they don't, they think it's bad to say, please leave. 
So be very considerate about that. So the Quran teaches that, us that, that you should be careful about that. And then also Allah says here, well, uh, you're not allowed to marry his, any of his wives after him. I, I mentioned that yesterday as well. Anas radiallahu anhu said that after everybody left, then he put the veil down. And he said that from that time, basically, this was the, this was basically the descent of the, uh, the, the hukum of hijab from now on. So now you had to take permission, permission to get in. You weren't allowed to look at the wives of the Prophet sallallahu anymore. And so on and so forth. All of that became uh, from that time. Now it carries on. I mean, after Surah An-Nur, which had a lot of the hijab laws and rules, this is the other surah uh, in these cluster of verses here where the other laws of hijab are mentioned. Right? For example, the niqab one is understood from verse 59, though there's a difference of opinion there, but that is basically, and I'm, and I'm going to come to that. That's why it mentions very clearly that if you are going to ask them for something, then ask them from behind the veil. Now you can't basically uh, ask them directly, you know, a, a face to face. Now if you jump to verse now, verse 59, that's where it says that, O Prophet, tell your wives... And so just for those who think that, you know, all of those rules were just for the wives, there's some people who claim that, that those laws, hijab is only for the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu And that's a major fallacy because 59, verse 59 is very clear. Tell your wives and the daughters and your daughters and the women of the believers that they should basically put over them, drape over them their jilbabs. And that is better, that is closer and that is more effective that they be then recognized and thus not uh, harmed because eventually what happened is that it was only uh, from that time onwards it was only the the concubines the slave girls that were allowed to keep their face open and all the all the the free women they would muslims they would they would cover their faces right and then there's a number of other discussions that take place down there and uh, then there's the discussion about asking for the Day of Judgment. You see, uh, there's a narration mentioned here uh, as a backdrop to this. Abu Talha radiallahu anhu relates that uh, one day the Prophet وسلم, came, approached us, and he, his face was beaming. Right? He was very, very excited, very, very happy. So we asked, Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, what is it? Right? What, what's, uh, why are you so happy about You know, you seem... Um, it's not, I mean, you seem more happier than even usual. I mean, he only, the Prophet ﷺ smiled anyway. So the Prophet ﷺ said that there was an angel that came to me today and said, Oh Muhammad, would you be, would you be joyed by the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that anybody who sends one blessing upon you will receive 10 blessings from Allah. And anybody who invokes peace on you once, they will get 10 peace sent upon them. So the Prophet ﷺ was very happy, not for himself, he's happy for the Ummah. This is a hadith from Musnad Ahmad and, and Nasai. That's why you have this verse here, 50. Six in Allah wa malaika tahu yu saluna ala nabi ya in yu haladina amanu salu alayhi wa salimu taslima. The verily Allah, His angels, they, they send blessings. I mean, Allah sends blessings. The, inv in, the angels invoke blessings from Allah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O people who believe, you also invoke blessings upon Him and invoke salams upon Him as well. Today is a Friday and uh, it's going to be Asr time soon here at least. And for other parts of the world it will be Asr time soon or maybe it's past for you if you're in Australia or somewhere. But anyway, Friday is a special day for Salawat and the Prophet ﷺ. So before Maghrib spend, at least people should spend 10-15 minutes sending Salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, especially on Friday uh, after Asr and at the night time after Maghrib on the Thursday night basically, which is the Friday night that comes before the day. Okay, just a few uh, points mentioned uh, uh, in terms of advice as to what the hijab should be about because there's a lot of misunderstanding of that. Hijab should be such that it should cover the, the entire body, the parts that need to be covered. It should be not an attractive hijab. I mean, what we mean by hijab here is not just the covering of the head, but the hijab means the entire garments that basically conceal, 
right? The modesty and the chastity. So it should be such that it's not attractive. It should be not so thin that basically it's translucent or transparent. It should not be. It should be basically wide enough and loose enough that it doesn't basically show the forms of the body. A lot of women wear hijab, but unfortunately the forms of the body show. All right? That's against the understanding of the hijab. It should not be perfumed so as that you leave a trail of perfume, which is a cause of attraction. I know some of these things are very difficult because workplaces require some of these things or there's a silent uh, kind of law that these things must happen. Anyway, then uh, another thing that's understood as well is that it should not be like men's clothing, right? Because that's prohibited as well and uh, accursed actually. And it should also be not copying vile and uh, people of uh, fusaq basically of uh, of people who are transgressors so those kind of styles should be uh, prohibited as uh, are prohibited as well and uh, finally the other thing we understand from the hadith, all of this stuff we understand from the hadiths and finally it should not be something to show off the thawba sh- shuharatin uh, it should not be basically clothing of arrogance and pride and to show off now finally the discussion ends uh, the, the, the the surah finishes with uh, speaking about do not be like those people who used to trouble Musa alayhi salam. Don't be like those, Allah says. Then finally, there's a very famous verse here, which is that we presented the trust uh, of upholding the laws of Allah and everything on many different things, on the heavens, the earth, the mountains. They all refused that they could not do this. Right? They're not going to be able to take this burden. The human said, we'll do it. So they've taken the burden, but unfortunately, they don't all make do with it well. So we ask Allah for tawfiq that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to do that well. I think we've covered most of the verses that, were, um, that we could cover here. So uh, now we move on to the next surah. The next surah is Surah, to, surah to Saba. This is also Makki surah. And Saba refers to a place in Yemen. Right? This is uh, a place in Yemen. This is uh, surah 54 verses, six sections you could say. And it starts off with the praise of Allah. Alhamdulillah, it's a hamd, right? Alhamdulillah, ladhi lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Right? It starts off with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created various different creations and He's got the perfect system in place. His nidham of the entire world is, He, he basically plans everything, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans everything. And the big point there, as verse, in, verse mentioned in three, uh, ver, uh, verse number three, and verse 2 actually, he knows everything. He knows what comes in, what goes out. He knows what's hidden. He, there's nothing small or large that basically is not recorded for him. He knows everything. It's like he's got meters and these instruments everywhere that record everything. In a kind of a modern understanding where you've got all of these gauges that you know, uh, measure the slightest tremor and the slightest movement of a hair and everything. All of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Then after that, there's a huge discussion about the big issue that they used to have a problem with about resurrection, right? You can read about that as well um, uh, in, in, in verse 7, for example, right? And uh, as it carries on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then begins a discussion from verse 10 of two prophets. That is Dawud alayhi salam and Sulaiman alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, I would say that one of the big themes of this surah is shukr. Because he's going to mention two, inc- uh, two cases. He's going to mention the case of Dawud and Sulaiman and all the bounties he showered upon them. He gave them some really extraordinary things, some things that he's not given to anybody else. The ability to hear animals and, and, and talk to them, to, to understand their language, right? And a number of other things. And the second issue he's going to talk about is why this surah then is called Surah to Saba, the Wajhud Tasmiyah. Right? The, reason for the, revel- the reason for the naming of this surah, Saba, is to talk about the, the people uh, of Saba. Right? I'm not sure if they call us Sabaites uh, or whatever. Right? But these are people in Yemen. Right? This was the people in Yemen. So inshallah, let's look at that. So firstly, Sulaiman alayhi salam, Dawud alayhi salam, their discussion, all the bounties that were given to them. So if you look at these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we gave Dawud alayhi salam huge amount of grace. And then we told the mountains... And the birds that they should sing along with him. He had an amazing voice. Like a miraculous voice, you could say. Inimitable, unchallengeable. That was unparalleled voice. And when he used to sing, mashallah, when he used to read the Torah, when he sing, I mean, he's not a nasheed artist, right? When he used to read the Torah, uh, the, the Psalms, right? That was his revelation, the Psalms. Then the mountains, the, the birds and everything, 
used to kind of take part in that. Number two, we basically made iron like wax in his hands. وَأَلَنَّا لَهُ الْحَدِيدِ And we told him, أَنِعْمَلْ سَابِغَاتِ Make coats of armor. وَقَدِّرْ فِي السَّرْدِ And in the links that you make the armors with, the, the armors are made with, make sure that they are equal. You know, they're, they're, they're parallel, they're, they're totally measured. Right? So basically, this was an ability that he, he essentially had an armor factory. Right? That's what he had. And it was very easy for him to do that because they didn't need any heavy smelting plants or uh, what do you call it, heavy industry machinery and all the rest of it. He could just do it with his hands. But do good deeds because Allah watches everything you do. Then it talks about some of the bounties of Sulaiman alayhi salam. We'd given him command over the wind. So basically the morning wind could be a month's journey. Basically, if you, uh, the, the morning wind could basically travel a month's journey. And the afternoon wind, the evening wind could tra- travel a month's journey. So this is in one day, he could basically take a journey of a month and come back. When you say a month is in those days by foot or by horse or whatever, this could be a, f- a, a horse for a month journey that could be done in one day by him. Basically he had, uh, you can say, a flying carpet of sorts, a flying throne or whatever that the wind would take wherever. The other thing we did for him is that we again gave him um, copper. Right? Uh, essentially, I don't know if this is, these are the copper times, you know, the iron age, the copper age. But basically for the copper, we basically also made that soft for him. We gave him ability over that. Then we gave him command over the jinn. And subhanAllah, he used to make them do some heavy, you know, all the heavy industry work that he needed done. He got the jinn to do that. That's why Allah says uh, in the next verse, number, 14, uh, number 13, that yet they used to make for him whatever there was, mihrabs, uh, you know, big, big, uh, uh, big pots and um, all sorts of different things. Again, Allah says, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُدَ shukra. Family of Dawood, make sure you are grateful and thankful because very few of my servants are thankful properly. And then the discussion is that when he did die, there was a certain way that he died and he died in that particular way so that the jinn would not know and they would continue working because they were under his command. Once he died, they would, be, they would stop working. So he basically, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him death while he was standing, I think, worshipping on, uh, using a staff. So he stood up like that and he basically died like that and he didn't fall until eventually, I think it was the, the woodworms or whatever that eat, ate up. His, uh, the, the part of the staff and that caused him to fall and that's when the jinn realized that had they known the unseen had they had this information they would not have had to work for all of this song they were very scared of him so they basically did the work so that's the end of the story so the main sh- thing we're getting from here is Allah has given you many riches you need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if you don't these were the two good ones they thanked Allah that was the example the next example that Allah is providing from verse 16 onwards is uh, or actually from verse 15 onwards is about the sabah. Right? Now sabah is لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَئٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةٍ we, we put sign, this was, these were truly signs that we had given to this inhabitants of the sabah, which is south of Yemen. Basically they had orchards, beautiful orchards, going for as far as the eyes could see. And in there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْكِ رَبِّكُمْ Eat from the sustenance of your Lord. They, were, they had some of the finest farming, finest orchard, finest trees and so on. And Allah says, look, eat whatever Allah has given you, but washkurula. Right? Thank Him. Baldatun tayyibah wa rabbun ghafoor. You've got a beautiful, wonderful place, right, to stay in, and you've got a forgiving Lord. As long as you're connected to your Lord, that's all you need in this world. فَأَعْرَدُوا But they ignored that. They had so many prophets come to them, but they refused. They, they used to just be arrogant. They used to f- have a false sense of security in their worldly uh, tools, in, in all of these worldly assets. So, you see, one of the reasons why they were so successful is because they had a huge dam. This was the Ma'arib Dam. Huge dam, and because of that, they, they, their irrigation was wonderful. And that's why they could grow so much and they could just Im- enjoy. Their orchards were just lush greenery, astonishing. So this sad in Arabic, sad is a, is a dam. So that's a ma'arib. Now the same thing which was a source of their pleasure and enjoyment, when they did not, when they did not do shukr to Allah and they were corrupt, that's when basically Allah had the dam break. That dam just gave way. And it basically flooded their entire area. 
So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that all of that lushness and greenery and beauty and sweetness, all of that, وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ I mean even the sound of that, ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ Just sounds that they were just left with basically wild berries and these thorny things that basically the, all the beauty was gone. And it's not something that they could use anymore. وَذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَفَرُوا and that is basically our response to them because of their, their uh, kufr here. They're basically, uh, you can translate this as ingratitude. وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورِ This is basically, the, the, these are the people that we give recompense that way. And then Allah mentioned some of the other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so beautiful for them that when they used to tra- travel for their business and so on up north, to the lands uh, uh, surrounding which we'd given barakah, Allah says, which refers to uh, Palestine and Sham. So th- basically from Yemen, they used to travel through Arabia, where Makkah, Mukarram, Medina, Munawar is, all of that. And basically they had, in that time, they had strategically placed localities, like service stations, places where they could stop, hotel, motels, khans, service stations, whatever it was. So that, and they had s- security. No highwaymen would drop them. It was like a perfect system that they had. They could travel really, really easily, securely and so on. All of that was destroyed. And today that's a sign for many of us. Both in a micro level at home, that if we've got so much, mashallah, we've got the nice cars, we've got all the assets we need in the house, the gadgets, the tools, the foods, the refrigerators full and everything, and beautiful children and everything. And if we don't do shukr to Allah. And likewise, on a more macro level, countries, regimes who mashallah Allah has given huge amounts to upcoming places with Allah if they do not do shukr the same kind of thing will happen to them as well nothing was left right in fact as I understand I mean the people there in fact that whole area was destroyed and the leftovers had to just disperse they traveled in different parts of the world they settled there that's why a lot of the Emiratis the, uh, like for example the, the Zaid family Right, of Abu Dhabi, they're actually originally from this area. And I remember they actually they had a project that they were trying to do. I mean, may Allah bring some respite to Yemen, right? But they were trying to do a project where this dam was because they actually hail originally from that area as far as, as, far as I remember. After those two main stories I mentioned, and that's why this surah, this surah is called Surah to Saba, that's mentioned now. The rest of it is basically going back, because it's a Makki surah, it talks about the aqaid and the beliefs of the mushrikeen, and it basically responds to them both in a rational way and in using other arguments and so on. Uh, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just trying to remind them and look outside, can, uh, wh- why don't you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why don't you worship Him as opposed to anybody else, who gives you this sustenance, who brings you the, the water from the heavens and so on and so forth, why don't you worship Him, right? And then finally Allah even challenges them that, okay, you know these people that you worship, these objects that you worship, you know, tell me what, has, what have they brought, what kind of characteristics have they produced and so on. Now, what we, what we learn about this is that because this is all about shukr and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look, look in verse 35, for example, it says, وَقَالُوا uh, One of the reasons why the mushrikeen of Makkah as well uh, had this false sense of security is that they were saying, وَقَالُوا نَحْنُ أَكْثَرُ أَمْوَالًا وَأَوْلَادًا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُعَذَّبِينَ We've got abundant wealth and children. Because they thought generally you got money, you got children as a strength, and you got money to pay for things that you need. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُعَذَّبِينَ We're never going to be punished. So then Allah says in the next verse 36, قُلْ إِنَّ رَبِّي يَبْسُطُ رِزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ It's Allah who expands sustenance for whom He wishes and constricts it for whom He wishes, but the majority of people do not know. Your wealth and your children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues that discussion. And again, Allah expands, faith, uh, expands uh, sustenance for whomever He wishes. But then the last verse I want to talk about is the 40, verse 46, which is that Allah is telling them to honestly and sincerely think about themselves and about the prophets. So, so Allah actually says that I give you one advice. إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدًا That you stand up for the sake of Allah, whether alone, together, two people, whatever, and then you think, collectively, alone, you think. That your companion, meaning this Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he's not insane. You know that deep down, and if you just take off all of the layers, right, of hatred, 
then that will come. He is just a warner. But as then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَدْ كَفَرُوا بِهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَيَكْذِفُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ The final verse, وَحِيلَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ مَا يَشْتَهُونَ كَمَا فُعِلَ بِأَشَاءِهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ Basically between what they wanted, what they desired, and themselves, there was, a, there was basically a, uh, a barrier put between them, and they remained in debilitating doubt. Okay, let us start Surah Al-Fatir. I've, uh, for, so for Surah Al-Fatir, um, I'm going to get somebody to... Uh, read A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi fatir as-samawati wal ard ja'il al-malaikati rusulan uli ajnihatin mathna wa thulatha wa arba' Yazidu fi al-khalq ma yasha إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ مَا يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ رَحْمَةٍ فَلَا مُمْسِكَ لَهَا وَمَا يُمْسِكْ فَلَا مُرْسِلَ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ هَلْ مِنْ خَالِقٍ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَرْزُقُكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ فَأَنَّا تُؤْفَكُونَ Talk about Surah Al-Fatir, Surah al uh, this is Surah Al-Fatir. Surah Al-Fatir, Alhamdulillahi Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard. So Surah Al-Fatir is a Makki Surah and there are 25 verses, sorry, there are 45 verses in here and there are 5 rukus in here. And again, because it's a Makki Surah, there's basically invitation to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned in here. Uh, the Dalail, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's evidences and so on. Again, it's the focus in here is to dismantle the, 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 the basis, the, the foundations of the shirk that would be committed by the mushrikeen of the time and emphasis on establishing the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why it starts off with speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator, right? So, فَطَرَ يَفْتُرُ means to basically split and take out something. So, all praises to Allah who essentially created the heavens and the earth, who brought them into being. جَاعِلِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ رُسُلًا who is the one who designates the, angel, the angels as messengers. أُلِي uh, أَجْنِحَةٍ you know, basically who have, um, uh, who have wings. مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَاعِ يَزِيدُ فِي الْخَلْكِ مَا يَشَاءَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases in creation whatever He wishes. Allah has ability over everything. Then Allah mentions in verse 2, what, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up and releases of His mercy, there's nobody to stop it. And anything that Allah prevents, then there's nobody to release it. And He is the mighty one and the wise one, an all-powerful one. Allah is then telling us, Ya ayyuhan nas, uthkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum. O oh people, remember Allah's bounties upon you. Hal min khaliqin ghayrullah. Remember talking to the, non uh, the disbelievers, so that's why it's, Ya ayyuhan nas. Is there a creator aside from Allah who gives you to eat in the heavens and the earth, who gives you sustenance in the heavens and the earth? There is no God except He. Where are you basically getting lost? Anyway, then the surah carries on. And it's got several different themes that I'll just quickly talk about. It talks about uh, all of these clear evidences in the heavens and the earth again. Those, those, a lot of those are mentioned. That means that whether somebody lives in a city, whether somebody's in a farmer, right? Whatever they, the person is doing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, for example, the importance of rain, how it, rain is needed to bring about revival of the earth and so on. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, he repeats the idea of how human beings are brought from stage to stage, again, at a time when nobody knew the intricate stages of the embryo. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, it discusses iman, hidayah, kufr, deviance, and it gives examples between them. So if you look at, 
from verse 19 to 22 for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ تَزَكَّى فَإِنَّمَا يَتَزَكَّى لِنَفْسِهِ That's verse 18. Whoever does purify themselves is going to be to his own benefit. وَمَا يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ Look, everybody knows that the one who can see is not the same as the one who cannot see. Likewise, darkness and light cannot be the same. They're both different things. Likewise, being in a shadow and being in glaring sunlight is totally different things. That's why those who are alive are not the same as those who are dead. And Allah allows to hear whom He wishes. And you cannot make those in the graves listen. In anta illa nadir, as the Prophet ﷺ is told, you're only a warner. And we sent you with the truth as a giver of glad tidings and a warner. And every ummah before has had a warner to it. The beautiful verses are these that, mashallah, they're always beautiful when you read them. Verse 27. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ ثَمَرَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهَا وَمِنَ الْجِبَالِ جُدَدٌ بِيضٌ وَمِنَ الْجِبَالِ جُدَدٌ بِيضٌ وَحُمْرٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهَا وَغَرَابِ بُسُودٌ وَمِنَ النَّاسِ وَالدَّوَابِّ وَالْأَنْعَامِ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ كَذَلِكَ إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء إن الله عزيز غفور. We could do a very lengthy tafsir on this. We don't have the time to do that. Basically, Allah is then telling us to just look around, that look at that fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sends uh, from the heavens, He sends water down, right? And because of that, we produce so many different flowers and fruits of mukh- of various different colors and tastes and things like that. Then another thing that's interesting that's mentioned in here, if you look at the mountains, the mountains are various different colors, white, red, different colors, and some are dark black. And subhanAllah, that's exactly the same. In fact, in China, there are several mountain ranges, right? There are quite a few mountains. It has a multiplicity of colors, like rainbow colors. It's quite amazing. People go there to watch them. Right? Allah is telling you who brings all of this about. Now there's reasons of why that's created, why Allah creates them, you know, with the various different mixtures of the earth and how those mountains are formed and so on. And then Allah talks about the people, the, the beasts, the, the, the cattle, and all of their different colors and everything that comes from them as well. And then in the middle of all of that, Allah mentions that it is only from His servants, the ulama, that fear Him. That's immediately actually within all of that discussion. So it's almost like, you look at these things, you ponder these things, the mountains, the, the fruits, the vegetation, the animals, all the different kingdoms. And if it gives you the realization that you must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reverently, then that means you're an alim. So here, ulama is not necessarily the one who's studied for so many years or has different ijazat, although I'm assuming that those would have had this information. If those do not have this reflection, then they're not ulama according to this. Because as the Mufassirin mentioned, that the ulama that's mentioned here is that anybody who's working in these fields as well, which, imagine a biologist, when he's thinking about the human anatomy and everything within there, and then it leads him to this, wow, look at this creation. A scientist, an astronomer, a physicist, right, who's thinking about these things, and then they think, wow, man, such elaborate system only God could have created this only a creator could have created this can't be random it's not like some random numbers and that leads them to fear Allah then those are the ones who are the alims here may Allah make us of the true ulama carries on that these are the people who recite the book of Allah I mean these several verses are really beautiful right uh, that, that verse was 27 that I just mentioned 27, 28 and it carries on 29 they, it talks about them reciting the book of Allah establishing the prayer right spending of what we've given them both uh, you know secretly, openly and they're basically looking for a trade that is never going to fail and always going to make profit and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا this Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the Qur'an, saying that those who are going to make inheritors of the Qur'an after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for example, they're going to split up into three types. And this is basically the state of the ummah at any given time. Okay? The state of the ummah at any given time. Allah says, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ 
some of these people who will come will be oppressing themselves. So they'll be doing a lot of wrongs. Okay? Wamin hum muqtasid. Some people will be just in between where their good and evil deeds are equal. They're moderate. Right? They do their best, but they're also not doing their best. And then wamin hum sabiqum bil khaira. Those who are basically at the forefront with goodness, with good deeds, by the permission of Allah. And that is a huge grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is mentioned in here to take away the idea, right, that all of these people, uh, 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 Allah makes it very clear in the next verse, that is to dis, uh, uh, make something clear in the next verse, which is to dispel the idea that anybody who is a believer, right, will stay in hellfire forever. Anybody who is a believer and has done wrong deeds, he may be sent to be punished. Right, there's a special place in hellfire, the top part, which is better than the rest of hellfire, still bad, but better than the rest of hellfire, where believers who have been sinful will be sent, if Allah wills. Right? Eventually they will all end up paradise, that's why Allah promises in verse 33, which is something to look forward to, right? Although we want to be of the highest group there, the sabiqum bil khayrat. Jannatu adni yadkhulunaha يُحَلَّوْنَ فِيهَا مِنْ أَسَابِرَ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَلُؤْلُؤَا وَلِبَاسُهُمْ فِيهَا حَرِيرٍ These will be again the gardens of permanence that they will enter and they will be basically given to wearing their jewellery of gold and, and pearls and their, their, their garments are going to be of silk and so on and so forth. So all of that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Then after that, it talks about the people of hellfire. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ La yuqda. Now it to, uh, gives an example of hellfire. La yuqda alayhim fayamutu. They're not going to be finished off completely so they can die and just become, you know, without feeling. So all that punishment doesn't bother them anymore. Wala yukhaffafu anhum min athabiha. But also, they're gonna, the, the punishment is not going to be lightened upon them either. It's going to be constant intensity. May Allah protect. And that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards those who are ungrateful. وَهُمْ يَسْتَرِخُونَ فِيهَا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses that, what, what they're going to do in there and so on and so forth. And now to move on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves from the book of Allah to the book of Allah of the heavens and the earth. And he talks about several different things uh, to, to say, why don't you read the open book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Outside, when you go, you'll see the open book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you're supposed to look at, what you're not supposed to look at, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alimu ghaybis samawati wal ard. Then again, there is fadila of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's mentioned again. Uh, sorry, fadila of uh, the, the Muslimin that is mentioned. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes the chapter. He says, Awalam yasiru fil awdi fayanthuru kayfa kana aqibatu alladheena min qablihim. Don't they travel the earth and they see what was the evil con eventual ending consequence of those people who were before them, even though they were much more stronger in, uh, in power, and uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing debilitates him. And then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهُمْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ بَصِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely uh, a witness to everything that his servants do. And that ends Surah Fatir for us. The prominent verses, I've already pointed out them to you, right? As I mentioned, some of the most beautiful verses, very reflective verse 27, 28, which I've already uh, pointed out to you. And uh, another one I want to point out is verse 5. Ya ayyuha nasu inna wa'adallahi haqq. Oh people, remember that everything Allah has promised is the truth. So let this dunya not deceive you. And uh, let it not basically deceive you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan is your enemy, as the next verse says. Make sure you take him as your enemy. right? And he just invites his group that they be from the people of hellfire. So that's something really to take to heart. So as I said, Surah, Al Surah Al Fatir um, has a lot of that uh, discussion in there, a lot of reflection in there. And now we move on to Surah Al Yasin. Surah Al Yasin is a huge surah. When I say huge, it's not that big in terms of length. It is a Makki surah for those who probably already know. And mashallah, many people already, I mean, put your hand up if you, you know, if you read it every day. Right? Give yourselves a pat on the back. 
right? Say Alhamdulillah. Because there are hadith, huge number of hadith about the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha. The Prophet ﷺ desired that it be in the heart of everybody, heart of every believer because it is the heart of the Qur'an, right? And for us to really analyze and understand and explicate that, we don't have the time to do that today or tomorrow. We will give a general uh, summary of the tafsir of Surah Yasin. But uh, I think we do have a detailed uh, tafsir of Surah Yasin, I think maybe in three uh, sessions uh, on zamzamacademy.com. So please feel free to look at the detailed one in there, right? But essentially, it starts off with Yasin, which is the name of the Prophet, وسلم, but also Huruf Muqatta'at. And that's why it says, Wal Quran al Hakim. Starts off with the discussion of the Quran, then says, Innaka lamin al Mursaleen. Yasin, Innaka lamin al Mursaleen. Ya, o oh Yasin, you are of the sent messengers. Ala sirati mustaqim upon the clear path. And this is a revelation from the mighty, merciful one. So that you can warn the people, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yasin. You see, Surah Yasin should be pondered over. That's why, inshallah, by tomorrow, if you can ponder the surah before we cover the rest of the tafsir of this, right? And we, we discuss some of the aspects here. The main, uh, then inshallah you'll benefit more because there's some main themes in there. One of the main themes in there is obviously trying to tell the Quraysh, right? That you guys have really exceeded in your deviance. And it basically become, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِينَ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And a lot of them, they're just not going to listen because of certain reasons. So there's already a decision that's been taken that they're not going to believe. And... Uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being told in number 10, verse 10 وَالسَّوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Whether you remind them or you don't Whether you warn them or you don't warn them They're not going to believe You can only warn those people Who follow the dhikr, the, remember, rem- the reminder, the remember, the Qur'an And who have fear of Rahman Who have fear of the most merciful one Even when they're alone so this is telling us essentially that if you want the Qur'an to penetrate and if you want the warnings to work, we need to open our hearts and we need to ask Allah that if until today nothing's happened to us and we don't, nothing affects us, then it may be that we've got a veil on our heart because this is kind of telling us that. So we have to ask Allah to lift that veil and Ramadan is the best time as any. So then he says about them, فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Give them glad tidings of forgiveness. They must have done something wrong for them to have forgiveness and a noble reward. Anyway, the discussion there is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent some messengers to a community. And uh, unfortunately, they did not listen. One after the other, they did not listen. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them. So then the discussion is going to be coming of Habib and Najjar, the carpenter, Habib. And that's something, inshallah, we will look at tomorrow. So all of these examples are being provided in here so that Quraysh can understand and hopefully they can learn from this. Many of them did, some of them didn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that particular locality. We will discuss that inshallah tomorrow. And by this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to complete. And Allah says in this last verse here, اِتَّبِعُوا مَنْ لَا يَسْأَلُكُمْ أَجْرًا وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ And by that he ends the 22nd juz of the Qur'an. So alhamdulillah by that we complete that I just want to mention one very interesting point That somebody asked me that about the other day That there's a discussion in the Quran Allah says that Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr We reveal this Quran in laylatul qadr Right? And laylatul qadr is generally understood to be in the last odd nights of the month Or the 27th or whatever But then there's also a hadith which mentions that the first revelation Was on the 17th of Ramadan so how do you reconcile between the two? Well, Ramadan was revealed in Laylatul Qadr. But that idea there was that it was taken the entire Qur'an from Allah al-Mahfuz, from the divine tablet. It was all taken to the first heavens, right? So then from there it would be sent over 23 years to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bit by bit. So the entire one massive download from file sent from Allah al-Mahfuz down to the first heaven was not Laylatul Qadr Thereafter that the first bit of revelation that came down The first initial message 
that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the first revelation he received through the angel was on the 17th of Ramadan. That was obviously before the fasting became obligatory and so on. So he was in the cave in the month of Ramadan in the 17th. So that was about, I don't know, five, six days ago, whatever it was. That's the first revelation. So that's the way you reconcile the two. Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, you know, bless us all for, for, uh, you know, for keeping up with this. May Allah be blessed for allowing us to keep up with this. We have a few days left, right? And then that will be our parting for the tafsir. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless us with the company, right? Uh, with this beautiful virtual company, inshaAllah. Right, what a beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided this in this time of lockdown as well. And uh, maybe we can even use this inshaAllah for the future as ways of education. Right? A lot of people have learned from this. So wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.